I covered that. Um, I apologize in advance if I ramble or sound like I, or if just what I talk about seems to not make sense. I'm a little insane. Uh, I tend to ramble. So, if you are not entertained, uh, it's your job to stop me by asking other questions. If you do not stop me, if you are not entertained, it's your fault. <laughs> So uh, we'll start with a quick introduction. Hello, my name is Josh Greeley. Uh, I'm a voice actor for Funimation Entertainment, Sentai Filmworks, uh, ADD Films, over 25,000, uh, a whole bunch of really, really awesome studios across the country, actually. Uh, some of the projects you may know me from are most recently, or some of my favorites, other than the Mr. Fade. Uh, Kenichi and Kenichi and Mike's Disciple, uh, Akihisa Yoshi and Bakken Test. Hey, Yoshi's my wife. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Kurenosuke and Princess Jellyfish. <laughs> it's just a fabulous dog. Uh, I'm an Arlair in Attack on Titan. Uh, Between the Stouts, we have cookies. Uh, <laughs> so down now, the devil's a part-timer. I will be the one to break the sales record for black pepper fries! <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kyohei Takano and the Wallflower. Bring me strawberries. Uh, Inspector Ginoza and Psycho Pass. Uh, let's see, let's see. Uh, any video game fans in the audience? Anybody who's a Tales fan? Uh, the, if you played the, late, the latest Tales of Zillia, Tales of Zillia 2, I played Luna Presnick, uh, who was quoted for saying. <laughs> <laughs> and. Twenty-five hours of... <laughs> How many different ways can I sound curious or excited? <laughs> Miffed. It's like you just got punched in the face. Okay. It sounds exactly as when I got punched in the gut. Throw me the very up a bit. Enough time. <laughs> You've got thirty hours of this. Uh, it was fun. Uh, let's see. Uh, Borderlands. Uh, Borderlands 2. I played a few characters. I played Dave. <laughs> Man, you love to kill. And it is such a glory kill, too. Who yes. here has played Borderlands 2? Okay, do you know who do you remember Dave? Do you know Dave? Okay, yeah. those are like it. Hey, Karima, know what's better than having a working shield? Not being a woman! <laughs> <laughs> That's Dave. We, we don't talk to him. <laughs> oh, it's so brilliant. Oh, I love it. You get to kill him so fast and it's glorious. Uh, Mr. Bony Pants? Oh, and Mr. Guy? Mr. Bony Pants guy! <laughs> he's the first boss in the Tiny Tina, uh, Tiny Tina's Dungeon Adventure thing, and it's like, he's the easiest thing ever. <laughs> uh, let's see, I have a few other characters. But yeah, uh, I'm also a writer. I've been writing, excuse me, I've been doing uh, ADR writing for Funimation and Sentai for a few years, uh, some shows I wrote. The first show I ever wrote was a little thing called Magic Kano. Uh, got kind of a little cool following up uh, online. It was kind of really kind of weird. <laughs> so, some, some memes came out of that. It was bizarre. It was fun. Uh, some of my most recent that I've written, uh, Shakugan Mushana Season 3. Uh, I've been one of the writers for Fairy Tale for the last two and a half, three years. And uh, the last couple of months, I've been one of the writers for Tokyo. Such a good job! <laughs> And I got to play Naki too, which was a blast. This is a big old crybaby fanboy. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Yori! <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's just that's some of the stuff I've done. Uh, I've been doing this for 11 years now. It's, I've reached the extent of my ambition <laughs> for this job a long time ago, and I'm just kind of writing it out now and seeing where it takes me. It's a blast. So this is a... I guess this is a Q&A. You said meet Josh Greeley. Like, you met me now, so I guess yep. it's over. Uh, All right. But uh, if you have any sort of questions, uh, this is a Q&A panel. I cannot provide the A, but you can provide the Q. Uh, and if, if you don't provide the Q, I will just keep rambling about it. So, yes? When you're writing for a show, does it help to keep in mind who's playing the role? If I know who's been cast, absolutely. Uh, like, sometimes when writing the first few episodes, and, and you, we have to have those written out so that we can actually audition for the shows. Uh, so you, you won't know. Like, you can have people in mind, but it's not necessarily the, that's who's going to get the part. Uh, so, 
once you do know, once it is cast, like once Fairy Tale is easy, and actually pretty much every show with the exception of Tokyo Blue I've written and uh, Cinder and Cogdor. Yeah. Uh, Tokyo Blue and Cinder and Cogdor were the only two shows I've written for funny that had not been cast at the time that I started writing. Uh, so stuff like Fairy Tale and stuff like Shaka Dunga Shana, those were already cast. I had the lead in one of them. Uh, <laughs> That was interesting. It's like, okay, let's make sure I don't give myself all the coolest lines. <laughs> Especially Yuji in season three, where he's got that ridiculously long battle of hair. It's just like, I wouldn't let hair back in the uh, Come up with so many jokes. Uh, it doesn't work for the show. Uh, but uh, Tokyo Pool, I had some people in mind. Um, like, I definitely thought Ring of Palencia would be Toka, and then she got it. I definitely thought that J. Michael Tatum would be Sukiyama. He was born to play that freaking role. Uh, and so, yeah, he, he obviously, like, I think Tatum was one person who was just like, we're not auditioning this part, it's yours. Because uh, like, there's nobody else who can pull it off perfectly. Um, but yeah, every other character is like, okay, it's really kind of nice, let's see what happens. Uh, so you, you tend to write more in that kind of situation. You, you always start off, and you always keep in mind character first and foremost, how the character will speak and what's the words, what type of words they would use in what situations, how they will react. Uh, but it does help when you do know who the people are, you, you know their cadence, their, their style of speaking, how fast, how slow they usually go, what's, what's too fast for them, what's awkward and slow, and, and you, 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 that's when you can really start to tailor a script for a particular character. Uh, like once I knew Austin Tenney had Connie Key. Okay, cool. I know how, I know how to speak, so I know that he can go really fast if he needs to. So I thought it was a bitch to fill in the flaps. That was a little too good. Tatum's character, Tatum can read and speak with speed of sound. But uh, that character, while crazy, he is so grandiose and everything that he does to, to try to fill those mouths with as many words as you can really takes away from the character. So, I, I almost underwrote just because I knew he was going to be able to, with it slightly underwritten, he'd be able to really play with and really, uh, uh, really, really play with the language. And if you've seen any of the season two Simon and Dubs, don't bother him in it, you know that they're all like that. Uh, so, uh, that's an awesome question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Well, are there any roles that you've uh, auditioned yeah. Uh, uh, the, the only one that I can think of, it was actually one that I did get, and then we lost the show. And it was just before ADV went under, went my little belly up. Uh, we had gotten the rights to Grimlock, oh. and I was cast as Simon. And oh. I, I, we had recorded the first five eps. And I'm one of like three people I know that actually has that first five app that I've got on it. And like it's in a special disc that's not even marked. That I have in a very special binder that I do not touch and nobody touches. Uh, yeah, I would like to at some point I, I, I will be transferring it to a digital thing and maybe it'll make its way out to the open uh, but yeah, like we had a blast with that. It was such a fun show. Uh, and you know, that's the nature of the beast. It, 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 for a while, when it first happened, we lost the show. It, it, it was still so early in my career. I felt like, I, you know, I, I went into like this really dark place in my mind when, when I realized that we had lost the rights. To, and God, you know, that was that was the biggest show I ever would have gotten. And like, it, the character was so cool, and I really loved it. And I was so like gung ho about it and fanboying out over just how because it was a it's trigger. How can you not like anything that those guys do, especially after Food and Cooley? Uh, it was just like, oh my god, I want to do this, especially because they were working with Gynax. It's like, oh, everything I've loved growing up about anime, it's, it's all like right here. And I lost it, and I got so depressed. And I can look back on it now and realize that if it hadn't happened, I probably would not have the career that I have now. Uh, if I had still been able to the show, because that's, that, uh, that trail of events, that sequence of events that happened that, it, that led to ADB kind of going belly under is what's uh, is what kind of inspired and lit fire under a lot of people's butts to go up to Dallas and try to see if they could join Funimation like full time. Uh, and Monica Rial ended up going up there because she wanted to try to direct and they got offered a job directing. And the first show they gave her was a little show called Kenichi. 
<laughs> and she she had worked with me for uh, for a couple of years down at ADV. She knew I was capable of, and we what funny didn't. And so she she kind of took a chance to ask her for her first directing show, bringing someone that they didn't know up for being the you know main character of this gigantic 50 episode show. And they were like, "All right, cool, we trust you." And you know now. I don't, I don't think I'd be anywhere near. I wouldn't have anywhere near the number of credits or, or have experienced anywhere near the number of really awesome things that I have or met as nearly as many cool people as I have without that happening. So it's checks and balances. Everything happens for a reason, right? Uh, I did finally watch Current, like in the rest of it, in the rest of its entirety after. Uh, and I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic show. And I thought the, that uh, Bandai did a great job with it, especially considering that since we had already started recording and the Japanese had a set release date and they still wanted that release date to be met, <laughs> they had to dub everything three times faster than what they would normally be able to. And so like, they had to rush through that thing. And for a rush job, they did a pretty amazing amount of work. So, hey, it's, a, it's the nature of the beast. There's a really good chance that I may never get to do any of the Kenichi OVAs. And if somebody, other studio grabs it, there's no guarantee that I'd be able to, you know, reprise that role. I would hate that. I would love to be able to play Kenichi again, or any of my characters, from no if they ever make any more jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, you know, it's just, you, it, it, being an actor, or just working in any sort of business, especially artistic, you, you have to be able to roll for it was a good lesson. Yes, ma'am. Um, Devil's Part-Timer and the Native Language. How much fun did you have? Oh, say? my God. <laughs> it was so cool. And, like, okay, who here have I seen Devil's Part-Timer or, or knows of it? <laughs> um, that language, when we first got the, like, the, the, the subtitle, not the subtitle, the, the, the actual raw translation from that, it was, you know, the script that was written in Japanese, uh, the language wasn't included. <laughs> and they were like, hey, what's up with it? Like, you know, what you do in language? They're like, oh, we just did gibberish. <laughs> like, uh, until something sounded, you know, like, yeah, cool, exactly. And so we're like, well, we can't do that. <laughs> because they were getting to do that to something they hadn't animated yet. We have to make the language two flaps that have already been animated and we can't change. So Jamie Markey, I mean, the brilliant lady that she is, came up with language. She came up with her own little system uh, to be able to uh, like take words and switch the like, she's, like she has this whole actually if you go to YouTube, uh, Funimation's YouTube channel they have a it's like a 20 minute clip like a little behind the scenes documentary where they're just interviewing her yeah, it's on the DVD. oh yeah it's on the DVD too and you, you we're talking where she talks about making coming up with the language and then the process that she did it's so cool because she cr had to create her own little dictionary for the words that she was making. I mean, every time that we repeated a word, like in, in the first episode, the one that you hear a, very, a, a lot is human. Mm -hmm. You say, oh, you humans are, are these human hands. Like, Zamun bombs! And like, uh, Zamun. Zamun was the word every time that we used it, anyone ever said human. Uh, the only words that stayed in English were if they were saying an English word from the new world they found themselves in, they were saying someone's name. Uh, and first coming in and doing it, it was so hard. It was a ridiculous challenge. And apparently those of us that have been doing this for longer had a harder time doing the language than the actors and actresses that it was their first time really doing anything major in the booth and they just sailed. Like, ah, I, don't, I don't get that. But uh, the thing that I think sold it that made it really easy was when Chris Bevins, who directed it, uh, told us, okay, you know what, I think what's going to sell this is if we add kind of a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Neutral uh, Eastern European dialect. Kind of like, it sounds kind of like you have that kind of Germanic Old English feel to it, but you also hit the R's in kind of the same way that uh, the Russian, like, uh, and maybe uh, any of the Baltic states uh, that, that they might, that the way that they so everything came out with, like, if I was just saying it in English, everything would kind of sound like this. Uh, but then you have this song on the prompts, and, you know, every, it just sounds like a complete, it sounds like an old world language. And it, it, we just, once we found it, and the way that it worked, it just flew. 
And in the, in the, it was really the thing that I hate about it. because who here watched uh, the dub on Netflix, or if you, if you watch the dub at all? Okay. Uh, the subtitles track that you have to turn on to be able to see the language and everything <coughs> sucks because they're using the translation sub. They're not using the subtitles that we put on the DVD that is actually what we wrote out. Like, whenever we recorded a line, we had the line as it was originally written in English, what we're saying, so that we could figure out what words in the, la in the fake language to you know, accentuate or hit harder or to not, or to throw away or anything like that to, and to make it sound like a natural speaking language. Uh, and that's the script that they put in for those subtitles on the DVD. So it, it actually has like those characters and their personalities behind the words they're saying. And I think that it really, helps sell the language a little bit more, and it has a lot more comedy to it, because there's some jokes that we in there, but you're completely missing them if you begin, because Netflix, I guess, won't import custom subtitles. So, Weak. if you want to get the full experience, <laughs> you gotta go get the DVD, or the Blu-ray. Uh, but yeah, it was so much fun. It was a blast to blast. Yes. Yes, yeah. So, okay, you've played Kazuya Aoi from Breeze, and mm -hmm. Yuki Taro Amano from Theater Diary, Yuji Sakai from Shakugan and Shana, yeah, yeah. and Ichiga Orimura from Infinite Strikes. So, I love Infinite Strikes. So, to sum it up, you've played quite a few ladies, man, over there. Yeah! Um, <laughs> it's like, really like, harem. Like, of all those guys, like, who would you say you've enjoyed playing the most? <laughs> Crap. Uh, that's a hard choice, right? Ichika, it's a toss up between Ichika and Yuji. Yuji, I think, just because, especially season three. Season one and season three of that show, like season two when I was first watching, it was like, this is just a gigantic filler season. Like, there was, it felt like nothing happened, nothing was going on, and then I realized. Once I started writing season three, holy crap, everything is important. <laughs> like, they, like there were so much little bitty things that you don't notice that they throw into the language that's supposed to be references to stuff that uh, in characters in the manga that they never put in the anime. Uh, so they'll just suddenly start talking about some random person because everyone in that show has three or four names. Uh, like you have Shauna. The blazing, the blazing haired, uh, blazing eyed hunter, uh, and then you just have, uh, I mean, and they did, like everybody has all these different god names, uh, battle names, and then their real name. Uh, and it's, it's, it's so pseudo, and it, it, it's so feudal Japan in, in the way that it's told. But you throwing out all these different names, if we haven't heard it before in the anime, we had no idea what they were talking about. And so we had to go look up all this different crap. And then in looking all that up, we realized. Oh my God! Every every little bitty nuance, these little things that we thought were nothing, and were just little throwbacks to the manga, were absolutely essential to the overall story in season three. And even stuff back in season one that they haven't touched on at all in season two comes back into play. And it, it was just this gigantic cluster. And we, it was ridiculous. It was the most challenging thing I've ever done in terms of writing. But the story overall. And having all those things and all that knowledge about it, and having all those different pieces come together, the story in season three, especially the whole war that they completely focus on, I, I thought was one of the greatest animated seasons of any show that I've seen in a long time. Especially considering it was done by the group that did Slayers back in the day. Like, it, like they came up with some really awesome stuff. Um, yeah, Slayers is my all-time favorite anime of all time ever. Period. Slayers movies. If you haven't seen it, get out. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, Orimura and you know, Ichika Infinite Stratos, it has an okay story. I, it, it's, it's, it doesn't really have, it's, it's okay. Like, it, there's really not that much of a story to it. It follows the usual harem thing. It's like, we'll set up this really badass story in the first episode or two. And then we end the story. Uh, and filler is nothing but how many awkward situations with these ladies can we put this dude in who obviously has no interest in any of them whatsoever. It's, it's so fantasy. That's, that, that's not accurate. That dude would be happy. Like, that dude would be having the time of his life. And that's the other thing. Like, we actually worked some of that in in the second season of Infinite Stratos where 
like after the whole birthday surprise thing where they're all showing up in different revealing outfits and you know that have to do with uh, different themes from their countries and like <sighs> they get up to some hijinks and at the end of that you know he in the entire thing he's just like awkward and everything's like I don't want to push boundaries because if any of these other one chicks sees me being forward to any particular chick I will die <laughs> <laughs> but afterwards when he's just by himself he's like man that was rough, but other than that, the rest of it rocks. <laughs> like, yeah, he's like, he's like, okay, he is a dude. He's a total. Uh, he's a teenage guy. Uh, that's the one thing about shows like that that really kind of gets to me is that sometimes it just seems like the dude is made out to be way too uninterested, too pure, or just too oblivious. It's like, but and, and at the same time, his character is the one that is the most grounded of everybody else. He's the one that sees the ridiculousness and calls everybody out on it, whereas everyone else is just like, no, it's totally natural for me to be in a poodle bikini. Like, it doesn't everybody? Like, it's just, yeah, it's yeah, stuff like that. Stratus doesn't really have a story overall as much as Shauna does. Like, so I, I would definitely, in, in terms of just overall calling the show, I would give it to you. And because he has a much more of a character development. Like, you see, Yuji starts off as this very unsure of himself, uh, kind of, you know, fish out of water thing. He, you know, he has no idea at first how to cope with the fact that he's not alive anymore. Uh, and just, and, and he struggles with that and his own ineptitude for a majority of the series. But then it's his love for Shauna and all that, all that relationship stuff that seems like filler in the second season is what ultimately leads to him realizing where his true feelings lie and who he would change the world and, and, and become basically a villain for. And that's, and, oh, it's so good! <laughs> Watch it! Uh, any other questions? <laughs> uh, let's see someone on the side. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Um, I guess harem related. How mm -hmm. is it dubbing um, from, uh, the protagonist from Magikoi? Oh my god. <laughs> Who here has seen Magikoi Oh Samurai Girls? Or at least has heard of it. Okay. I'm kind of laugh if there's so few hands. <laughs> you want to talk about fan service for the sake of fan service and no story. Like, there's, a, there's a hint of a story. But they're just like, story's not important. Look at these. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was like, especially Brittany Karbowski's character. And that one, she, I can't remember the character's name for the life of me, but she, she has purple hair. She's the only one in the show that has purple hair. And she wants that dude bad. <laughs> like, it's, it's painful how much she wants this man. And it's, oh, the stuff that she pulls. And they're like, like the, they, they go borderline on a lot of this stuff. Like, they, they even to animate, like, morning wood. And, or at least you think it is. Because apparently he knows secret ninja techniques. <laughs> and oh, yeah. and it, like like the whole Naruto thing where they vanish and there's a log left behind. <laughs> Morning one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's funny. They blow a lot of like fan service when it's used to accentuate comedy or when it's used to you know like tell a joke or whatever or, or even where it, like if you can find a way to like yes some characters have gigantic racks when not it, like as long as not all characters do you can then it's more realistic. But I do get that for the sake of, I'm sorry, I'm babbling, I'm sorry. I do get for the sake of just, it's fantasy. And it's not meant to be taken seriously. You have, you know, all these ridiculously well-endowed ladies that, you know, their bodies, like, no one is this thin. Like, <laughs> but like, it doesn't work that way. Um, but it's fantasy. It, it's, it, it's, it's not anything that you're supposed to be like, uh, take seriously or, or to or to feel like, oh, well, I need to be like that or anything like that. It, it's just something for enjoyment. It's something that it's meant to be able to just turn your brain off for a while and just enjoy a bunch of pretty colors and ridiculousness. Uh, and sparkly, gravity-defined boobies. Um, See, this is the only thing I'm waiting for is why don't we have sparkling, gravity defined male genitals? Like, what's that happening? Like, free is almost there. Almost. Come on, guys. It's like, yeah, work those apps. Sissy yes. Work those apps. Uh, 
it, see, and that's the other thing. I'm so glad to see that there's more shows like Free coming out because we're starting like females only make up half the population of this planet, uh, and are kind of the majority are becoming the majority of fans in the anime fandom. Like, it, like you think about how anime cons used to be 10, 15, 20 years ago, and the male to female ratio is nowhere near what it is now. There's more women in here than there are guys, like by far, and that's pretty much what it's been for the entire con, and almost every con I go to, it's it's such a, in, in, it's it's equal in, in many ways, where I, I you do see a, an equal number of both male and female, but it, it's, it's so cool to see that there's so many more people that can feel comfortable coming to these shows, and that they feel like they can be a part of this fandom and be accepted. Like, 20 years ago, you know, and we still had, you know, dudes like, no, this is for guys. Why are girls in this? I don't care. Why don't you go play with your dolly? Like, screw you. So, I watch My Little Pony, and I love it. <laughs> girls should be able to watch badass giant robots kicking butt. So, I like that I used ass and butt at the same time. I'll censor myself the latter half. Um, <laughs> ADD boy. Uh, another question. Yes, sir. What's your approach on uh, upkeeping your vocal health? Vocal health, dude. I've never been asked that question. That's really who, who didn't hear the question. Okay, right. All right. Uh, really, it's and, and, and this also goes for like if you're ever like training your voice or just using it. it it's it's all about just uh, if you're doing voices for a very long time or for an extended period and you get to the point where you feel a tightness in your throat. I, I always equate it to like anybody who's ever worked out in like a particular part of their body really hard and you know you get that tightness and it, like it's not necessarily a pain yet it, 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 but it's, it's, it's a pull and this really tightness. Once you start to feel that because your vocal, your vocal cords are a muscle just like any other part of it. Once it gets to that point, stop! <laughs> stop what you're doing, shut up! <laughs> like, you just drink a bunch of water, and you like, always have water, specifically room temperature water. Hot water makes it too relaxed and can potentially damage and burn your cords. Cold water constricts them and potentially damage it if you're having to do really crazy voices. Room temperature is the way, is the way to go. Um, and uh, I, I, I'm constantly making voices, and I'm constantly making weird noises every moment of the day. My roommate before I moved in with her was super skittish and like would jump and just if you came in out of nowhere was just like hey and just like barely saying anything if she was focused on something you could like, anything would completely bring her out of it. a leaf moving would start <laughs> like now three years after living with me she doesn't bat an eye I'm pretty sure she could hear someone breaking into the house and she would just be like oh whatever it's just Josh <laughs> According to her boyfriend, actually Tyson Reinhardt, uh, who he's one of the writers for uh, uh, one of the writers for Attack on Titan, and uh, he's just insane. If you've ever met him at a con, he's one of the coolest dudes ever. A huge fan boy, a big old nerd, punk rocker. He's badass. Uh, he he told her he he, I, he had my favorite quote talking to her. It's, uh, we were at a con and someone walked by making some weird noise. And she didn't bat an eye. It's like and she even she points out, wow, you know, really says something that you know. Noises like that don't even grab my attention, and Tyson goes, "Well, you live with a strange noise." <laughs> like, yeah, it's true. Uh, but yeah, it's the, I'm constantly doing stuff like that. I'm constantly working out my vocal cords, and I'm constantly like just exploring and doing ridiculous stuff just to see how far I can go with with it in either direction. And it, you, it, it, it's different for every voice actor. Everyone has their own process to be able to keep their voice healthy, you know, everybody has their little remedies or their, their, their special herbal treatments and stuff, but uh, for me, it's just, it, it's very simple. The basics are just keep your voice well, keep hydrated, keep your voice well lubricated. If you're going to be working it out, uh, stop the moment that you feel any sort of strain or pain. Do not talk. If you do have to talk, talk very softly or whisper the way you have to do, just make sure that you're not hurting your cords. Because uh, you can lose your voice real quick, and then you'll be out of it for sometimes days, sometimes weeks. I know some uh, Sherry Lee. Sherry Lee has lost her voice on so many projects before. They have had to like medical has put her on mandatory vocal rest, and she couldn't almost talk for a month. Or two. That's a lot of work being missed. Uh, so yeah.
that's pretty much all. Also, avoid anything with sugar and avoid coffee. I know a lot of a lot of people drink coffee before they record, and we know for some people it works, but generally it's a really bad idea to have anything with sugar, whether it's artificial sweetener or not, uh, because you can form a sugar coating on your throats that will tear them up if you're not careful. Uh, any sort of sugar buildup like that can really, really hurt. Um, yeah, that's, if I think of something else, I'll let you know. Actually, hang on, you better pick up for a minute. Um, just speaking, the speaking of free, what kind of direction were you given to being Aicho? To being Nitori? Uh, they just said, you know, he's uh, like, look, uh, I looked him up for a bit, uh, I read up, you know, all the stuff in the wiki, and, and, and the general direction I got was, you know, he's more or less like many of the characters that, that I've played before. Uh, I liked that, he, he, he seemed a lot like Kenichi in the very beginning to me, like, just because he's very hard, uh, he's so hard working, he's very driven, uh, he has his inspirations and his role model. Uh, that he wants to even work up to. And for me, it's not necessarily, it seems to me like it's not necessarily that he's about competing and winning. He just wants the honor of being, of having the chance to compete alongside the people that he looks up to. Uh, and I really enjoyed seeing where all of his hard work ends up paying off at the end of the second season. You know, the job they give him, I'm like, yeah, that makes sense. That is what I would have done for him too. And I'm really excited to see what, if there is a season three, and if we get to do it, you know, where that might go, but in generally the direction was just, well, even in the higher range, uh, he's very, he's eager to please, he's very excited, you know, all the time, he's almost kind of a fanboy in his own way, especially <laughs> when it comes to Reed. Uh, oh, Reed! Uh, <coughs> but, uh, yeah, there really wasn't any particular direction that Jerry, uh, unless I just went ridiculous with something, because I, eh, that seems a little out of character for him, he, he pulled me back, but, Jerry has is one of those directors that has a really is really good about it. he knows what he wants, but he also gives the actors the freedom to explore the character and, and you know see what they will do with the lines before he'll say okay that's good but I would rather hear something like this uh, and so like if there was any direction it would be after I had tried something and I can't really remember right now because it was so fast that we went through that show <laughs> it's just like okay we're doing it. Okay, because uh, we didn't even audition for it. They just called me up and they were like, "Hey, we're doing this show. We want you to play this character." <laughs> okay, and I go in, and then I go and look it up. I was like, "Oh, he's the power bottom. Of course, I'm playing this character." <laughs> 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 um, I love it though. Like the very first thing I just type in, Ari, uh, Nikori, free. The first image I see is him up against a fence with, with like, you know, abs showing or whatever, and he's just looking all cute and shit, and like, oh. Uh, uh, okay. And then I got to check out the rest of the show. Like, I, I had not really seen, like, I had seen bits and pieces, and I had seen cosplayers, and I knew that it was becoming this really, you know, big fan favorite, and I understood why, and I applauded it, especially when we started seeing all those freaking trolls on online being like, this show is stupid, like, it, that's not right male anatomy, no males look like that, and half the females on the planet were just like, I love your tears. <laughs> Feed me your tears. tears. Great, great nutrition. Yep, that's what you get, guys. <laughs> You totally be like anime characters. Oh my god. No, they shouldn't. <laughs> if everyone looked like that, it would be a really boring place. <laughs> and nobody would be happy. There would be like even if everybody was stick thin and you know unhealthy with the image that you know they're they're told they're supposed to be these days, then somebody would find some way of saying, No, I'm too fat. Or no, I'm out of shape, or anything like that, or no, you're supposed to be this, because this is right. And, you know, be you and be happy. Uh, sorry, I'm going on a tangent. <laughs> when did I start this? No. Okay, so it's in 30 minutes. Sweet! Um, any other questions? Yes, you. Yeah, we were going to direct to you. I'm sorry. I'm just wondering, how did you get into voice acting? Like, okay. Did you always do voice acting you like, a little kid or anything? Our animation was kind of my first love, first and foremost. I think my first words in this world, other than Mama Dada, were DuckTales Woo Woo. Uh, 
<laughs> like, I mean, it was one of my, it was my favorite show growing up. Like, that song, you know, you can't get it out of your head. Once you hear it, it will it's never live. Uh, <laughs> nostalgia critics said it best, it festers and it stays. Um, but, uh, yeah, just animation in general was something that I always really gravitated to. Like, in like I'm a movie fan, I like movies, and I'm, like, I'm really only just now starting to come into my own in terms of finding movies that I like. Uh, I only ever watched movies with my family. The only movies that I would watch by myself that I just floor floored over was Star Wars, Star Trek, <laughs> Indiana Jones, <laughs> Ghostbusters, and uh, sometimes Fifth Element after I was able to see it. Um, so, but I, in the interim, I had I had this whole world of animation at my fingertips and all these wonderful characters and these fantastical stories. And uh, I had been exposed to some anime. I didn't know it was anime, but I had been exposed to actually this is really funny. Who here, growing up, okay, who here was like raised in the 80s? All right, any of you ever remember a cartoon, it was a faith-based cartoon called Superbook? It was this, you do? All right, it was this story, it, like it was a Bible-based, uh, you know, story, like if I ever could make it to church, because I, my family was really religious, uh, we grew up in the Bible Belt in Texas, of course we were going to go to church. Um, if we couldn't make it to church, or I just didn't feel like going one day, and I just really, because God dang, if I threw a temper tantrum, there was no getting out of it. <laughs> like, I'm staying home! Uh, they would have me watch an episode or two of Superbook, so that I could at least have something, something of God in my life on Sunday. Um, Superbook was about these two kids that were, in, they would find some problem in their lives that day, and they would correspond, and all of a sudden they would realize, oh, the Superbook is calling us. And they'd go up to their attic, and there was this really good book, and it's supposed to look like, you know, a big tone style Bible. And the voice of God would say, well, you know, this is, you know, there's a story in here that is very much like what you're going through right now. And they would be pulled into the Bible, and they would meet these biblical characters and stuff. The Superbook was animated by Toei. <laughs> Dragon Ball Z. <laughs> There's Jesus. What's his power level? <laughs> it's a thousand and six. One thousand. <laughs> Can you imagine how epic the Cain and Abel fight would have been? <laughs> oh my God, it would have been so cool. But yeah, you know, it, it, it was animated by them. That was something that was farmed out to Toei to animate, and like. But it was done very much in their style, uh, and I didn't know what it was. Like I, I just realized that oh, I mean it's a cartoon, and I love the way that they're drawing the people, but their mouths are moving really weird. <laughs> like that just that's it's interesting. Um, and then you know later down in, in my life, I got uh, I eventually got exposed to Sailor Moon. It was the very first anime that I knew was anime, and that they're just like wow, I really like the art. And I went and watched it, and I'm like I am hooked on this. Uh, and then if we finally got to the army, the cut kale <laughs> in my own town back in like 2002. Uh, uh, but uh, around the age of five, my mom put me in the theater because I was always making voices. I was always imitating the stuff that I was seeing. I was always acting out my favorite scenes from movies. Especially once I, I fell in love, I realized, oh, they release soundtracks of these things. And so my brother and I would put in like, the soundtrack of Star Wars and Indiana Jones into our new CD player. And, uh, we would just reenact scenes to the music, just and, and we would make costumes out of the Afghans and stuff in our house. And my mom finally got tired of us, you know, ruining her linen, so I could be Darth Vader. Uh, and you know, she put me in the theater so I could ruin other people's linen. <laughs> but uh, I fell in love with it. The very first show that I did, I was like five or six years old, and I, I played Gollum in a children's version of the of the Hobbit. Uh, and, and from then on, it was you know I, I, I got. Uh, I kept doing it uh, on and off, I growing up, but then the thing with the ear that really bummed me, and, you know, I grew up a geek, I grew up a really big kid, uh, I, was, I was always, uh, I was always a little heavy set. Uh, I was picking on a lot for it, and, and theater was such a really great escape because I could go meet these other people. Uh, and, but still, the problem with theater, at least to me, is like, while it's, you absolutely have to do it if you want to be an actor, uh, and it really lasts once you find your niche in it and then you find something that you love doing. The only issue is, for me, I felt way too limited, way too constricted because no matter what you do, no matter what you are capable of doing performance-wise, when it comes to theater, you're going to be, 
you're, they're going to put you in a character that matches your physicality. Uh, and, and so there was a whole range of characters that were essentially unavoidable, uh, like uh, uh, unattainable. And a oh, voice. And it doesn't matter. And your boy, like, whatever I can do with my voice, I can play any character. Like, like Chris Ayer said it best when we were doing, uh, when we were doing the uh, documentary or commentary for one of the episodes of uh, Gotcha Mon a few years back. My voice may not be, like, I may not be a 600 pound Hispanic superhero. But my voice can be. And it's really it's a, whatever the limitations of your imagination, uh, your performance, and your like what you trained yourself over to do, or just what your voice can do. There's an entire world of characters, and, or just cartoons in general, cartoons, video games, book on tape, uh, all of those, especially book on tape, because that's one person who needs to play an entire universe of characters. Uh, it, it just, it, it, I was so drawn to that, and so I, I, I it, then there was that, that really awesome moment where you realize, oh wait, Scrooge McDuck's not real, that's someone doing a voice. <laughs> I want that job! <laughs> and the deal was sealed when I was like 11, like 10 or 11, it may have been a little younger. We went on, uh, for spring break one year, my friend, we went to uh, Taos, New Mexico, uh, it's this really lovely area with a bunch of Pueblo very uh, old Native American style uh, housing and, and culture, and it's this gigantic ski resort because apparently New Mexico gets lots of snow. <laughs> and uh, we went skiing there one year, and uh, my brother and I had gone through this like two or three day long uh, ski class. And we had to do mandatory with all these other kids, and there was this one girl that I really kind of took a uh, into a shine to. And we went into the cafeteria one day after after lessons, and I went up to her, and after I got my food, and I was like, I'm gonna show off. I'm gonna do some voices for her. And I throw out my final trick. And, and she just looks at me like, my dad is Donald Duck. Look over, and the dude who was the voice of Donald Duck for Quack Pack back in the 90s is right there, and he just goes, I'm gonna shot you. Like this is my destiny. <laughs> like totally just fanboy now. Wanted to ask him all sorts of questions and everything. It was just like, man, what a small world. And I was just like, you know what? I have to do this. Like I would never have known if he hadn't done the voice or whatever. I just love it. See, like my dad is Donald Duck. Like you, you're gonna have to throw out some Mickey or something. <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. But uh. That kind of sealed the deal, and then I, I really started to play around with voices a lot more. I started to try to imitate everybody and everything. Uh, and, and that's the thing, any sort of art, you always begin with imitation. That's, that's how you learn, that's how you find stuff that not only brings you in, that makes you feel artistic and creative, but it also allows you to eventually find your own stuff. And so, yeah, I, I just kept doing it. I kept doing theater as I was growing up, and then uh, I became a hardcore anime fan, and then. Uh, I created, because there were not a lot of anime fans in my hometown, and uh, this was back in the day of still HTML, in my high school class, in my high school years, uh, whenever we were taking like HTML class, I would totally screw around, and I'd behind, like when the teacher wasn't looking, I was slowly building an anime forum. Be, uh, like over Angel Fire, or Geo Cities, you know, like way back when. and. Uh, Made a lot of friends over the course of that, and I, I was able to find a lot of people that were in my you know, similar interests and stuff with me. And then one of them, a really good friend of mine, who lived in Austin, just an hour and a half, two hours south of me, went to school with the girl that was the voice of Nadia in Nadia's Secret of Blue Water. It was like in the same class as her, uh, who'd never seen Nadia's Secret of Blue Water. It was uh, the show that was made just before Ed and Yellow, by the same creator. Uh, such a good watch. If you haven't seen it, find it. I'm pretty sure you can find it in the future. Uh, but I got the number for ADD Films Monster Island Studio from him. He got it from her. I never would have had that if I hadn't created that anime for him. <laughs> like, just like sneakily making stuff in, you know, in class. And uh, this was my senior year. And I, I sat on having that number for several months. I was like, is this really something that I want to try? Am I, am I, do I even have the chops for this? Is this something that I can do? And finally I decided, no, you know what? I'm going to prove this to myself that I can make this work. And, uh, I kept calling. I called them up once a month uh, during the first semester of my high school, uh, my senior year, and uh, 
January of 04, my senior year before I graduated, they gave me my first pull down. And I went and I did a bunch of what is called scream and die sessions and, uh, for them. And you know, it wasn't paid work. You know, we just went in and we screamed and we died many, many, many times. Uh, and played little bit characters and stuff like that in shows. The very first show I did was in the, the third volume of Winnie Punch. And uh, it just kept it just kept bringing me back. Didn't get paid to do any of the work for a year, just got a free copy of the anime, but I got to cut my teeth and I got to, you know, get my technique down and, and really explore it and show them what I could do. And then by the end of that year, ABB's, the Austin studio had shut down because of budget issues. And I thought, well, that's it. And then the director that I worked with a lot moved back down to Houston where their main office was. He ended up calling me, calling me up like three months later saying, hey, I'm about to work on this 107 episode series called Gachamon. I'd like for you to come down and help me do it. And I'm like, hell yeah! And then so I got to go down to the main office and uh, cut my teeth on that for two years and got to meet other, over the course of that, got to meet other directors and just working with me. And all of a sudden it was like, holy crap, I have nothing but anime work now. And then it just it kept going. And here I am 11 years later. And I'm still writing it out. I have no idea when it'll end. And I don't care. Uh, but yeah, that's, and, and here's the thing. There's, it's, that's my path. That's my story. But it's everyone that I know has had their own path. There's, there's no one single way of finding it. But uh, I, I, at the end of the day, it just comes down with having a good attitude, having the chops, like having have you know, actual acting experience and having trained your voice, and just being easy to work with, being able to take direction, and chasing it down, and never, never letting a, a rejection or a no get you down. Because 90% of this job is being told no. It's like, no, you're going to get the part. No, we're not going to be using you for this. And, and it's, it's the yeses that really make it work. It's totally labor. Yes, sir? Uh, as you have um, grown as a performer, you know, from age notoriety and whatnot as an actor, um, how did you adjust to getting a fan base and increasing and you know, being in front of a packed room like this? How you would, like, were there any hiccups along the way when you were first taking out and you reacted to it? You might be like the first anime that uh, I heard myself. Yeah. Dude, the first time I put the headphones on and talked to the microphone, I was like, that's what I sound like? <laughs> Why am I here? Um, but, and, and, yeah, and, you know, the first time that you hear yourself both in the cans and the first time you hear yourself have, having been professionally mixed and coming out of a TV, it is so surreal. And it is so just bizarre. And for the first time I heard it, I was like, oh, that's uncomfortable. I don't like that. And you, you, you get used to it. Like, you get used to hearing yourself. Uh, but, I mean, growing, uh, growing as a performer, absolutely, I have gone leaps and bounds through voice work. In fact, I would say my vocal performances when I was starting on stage were my weakest, the weakest part of my repertoire. And now, uh, repertoire. Uh, <laughs> not even using that correctly. Um, but now it's absolutely my strongest feature. It's, it's, the, it's the thing that I've honed the most, that I've trained the most, and I, I finally did theater again a couple of years ago after 10 years of not doing any, and it was a whole different ball game. Like, I had so much control over my voice, and I was able to be confident with everything I did, and to be able to play around with the language instead of feeling stilted and, and, you know, and not being able to really perform. Uh, the only thing that I had to get back into the gear of was not having to stay in one position <laughs> the entire time, and, uh, having to use my, you know, use facial expression as much as vocal performance to be able to portray what you're doing. Um, what was the other part of the question? It was kind of full learning. <laughs> Sorry, you kind of started rambling. Yeah, um, that's what I do. But I, I was asking you more about how, as you gain notoriety as a performer from fans, from people that love your work, hate your work, etc. How has how was the adjustment to that from being, you know, just some guy cutting his teeth to there's a room full of people here to see you now? Yeah, it's it's humbling beyond words. It's uh, it's surreal. Like it, it, I'm not like as much as I like performing, I have always been really shy, and you know, I, I had to work through stage fright. I still have to work through it. I get butterflies in my stomach, you know, any, any time before I go on stage, before I come up for a panel, before I look for anything, you know, it's it, it's that performer thing. But you know, uh, having worked through all of that, it does feel like, wow, I really have accomplished a lot of really neat 
things in this, and I had I had some expectations, I had some milestones that I set, but in terms of like the career or where I wanted it to go and what I wanted to at least accomplish in it before I said, okay, I'm happy with this and I'm done, and I'll see if I can find something else. Um, I hit every single one of the milestones. I I, I was I was going to be happy if I only hit the first one. That was just getting a named character and being able to say, yeah, I was able to do that. Uh, and now, you know, coming from from that to where I am now to this, it's I can't put it into words, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's really no way to, to describe it. Uh, other than it just means a whole hell of a lot to me. Just anything that, that you feel interested at all in anything that you have to say. Or, uh, I was a fanboy. I'm just like I'm, I'm a fan that ended up having a cool job and the thing that you love. Like I, I don't. That's all I am. I'm just another guy. I'm, I, I'm come. You know, I, I come here and I feel comfortable here because you guys are my people. You guys are, are the, people. It's the people that I wish that I could have had in my hometown my entire life. Uh, so it, it, it feels more like the fact that I've been able to make a place for myself and in, in, in the thing that I love. Uh, that means a lot to me. But everything else is just icing on the cake. And getting to meet everybody, and like getting to meet all these really cool people, and, and, and having heard the stories like from some people about how some shows or some performances have like helped them through hard times in their life or anything like that. It's like, God, how can you not be humbled by that? How can it not, like I can yeah, it can it can change you for the worse, but like I, I, I just I strive for it to always inspire me into how to change people better. And you guys help me do that. You help keep me on my own moral path. And I can't thank you enough for that and for making me feel for, uh, for making me feel special. And I just want to be able to get that back and to make you all feel special too. That's it. <laughs> That's my answer. Yes. Uh, stories of working with Monica or any other voice actors. Uh, I was a really big fan of Monica's work growing up. She was some like some of the first anime that I ever bought for myself that was in the mainstream stuff. She was always in uh, Excel Saga, uh, Steel Angel Purimi, uh Puni Puni Poemi, uh, Those Who Hunt Elves, and like all like just all and Jessica Cabello and all these other people that I just grew up listening to. And I'm like, man, this really had fun with these characters. Uh, mostly it was just trying not to fanboy <laughs> whenever I met her. Like the first time I met her, I was like, here, Monica, here y'all. <laughs> Love work. Um, but yeah, now, oh, now over the years, we, we've, become, we've become friends. And like we were, she's my lead writer. She's the one that, like, every time that, ever since Houston, every time I've started a new milestone or a new job at Funimation, it's been Monica that's gotten it. She brought me up for Kenny She took a chance on me there. She's the one that got me to write the gig because she took a chance on me and said, no, he can do this. Uh, it's, yeah, just all of it, all of it has been, a lot of it has been thanks to Monica leaving me and like, I can't think of enough for all that. Uh, getting directed by her in Kenichi had a lot of fun moments. Just any time that we could, especially Kenichi's zany, ridiculous reactions when he's getting trained. Like we had some that, we would just roll on the floor laughing sometimes after because you, know, you, just, you, you can't have everything sound exactly the same. So sometimes you just have to let your voice go somewhere and do something crazy. And there was one, I remember one scene where Apachai uh, was like, okay, now you dodge. And, and so, you know, he hits and Kenichi just goes flying. And, like the reaction I got was like a, <laughs> we just started howling. It's like, it sounds like a chicken. <laughs> And then getting to hear Monica play, like her bit part that like she plays one of uh, it's not maybe it's Loki. Yeah, I think it was Loki, like one of Loki's uh, henchmen uh, that always has the like goggles or whatever on. Uh, she was just insane. And getting to play off of her and, and getting to hear her uh, was just such a treat, especially because she was so hilarious. I couldn't record half my lines just because she was in my ear before I had to record. I was just giggling. Um, Experiences like you remember Charlie Campbell, who was one of my first directors. He's the guy that brought me down to Houston. 
uh, Ian Sinclair, uh, Space Dandy, you know, uh, a few Torico. Getting to do Torico with Ian was so cool because Ian and I, when I first moved to Dallas, he was my roommate. Or I was his roommate. Like, uh, and uh, we had this, like, it was almost like Nerd Central where we lived. It was paradise. Uh, and uh, you know he was directing Black Butler at the time, and you know he had just been, you know, he just started directing, and then I was still like getting, I was really starting to get a lot of work in terms of voice work, but I was still coming in my own information. So we, we had just a lot of fun times talking with each other and uh, playing off of each other, and, and like he taught me a lot in terms of not only voice and acting, but dude's also a boss of a cook, and I used to burn water. <laughs> like this dude, this dude taught me how to at least not suck. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to cooking, uh, and, and then it was even more fun, you know, having lived with him and, and having, like, especially having the cooking on food that was a real bonding thing for us, to then get to play Toriko and Komatsu together in Toriko a couple of years later was such a blast because we were just like, that show was made for Ian. Toriko is Ian. Ian is Toriko. Um, I never see them in the same room together. Um, <laughs> Um, but like it, it was so, it was so cool over the course of like the audition period for Tori Co. We were both just chomping to the bit, and I was like, "Dude, you so need this role. It belongs to you. Like it, it's made for you." And he was like, "Dude, you should so be Kumatsu." And we waited for like a week to hear something back, and after like a week and a half, we were like, "Usually, but when that time they already have a cast and they have a recording, so we were like, uh, I guess we didn't get it." And I was at home one day, and I was you know doing, I was writing a script, and. Uh, he calls me up and he's like, hey man, he's like, hey buddy, and I'm sitting there waiting to hear, and he's like, well, I got cast, I got the part, and I was like, dude, that's awesome, congrats, man, and like, he was just playing it off, like, he like, just told like, man, uh, he goes, yeah, man, like, it's gonna be fun. Do you wanna know who you're playing? <laughs> <laughs> yes! He goes, you're my buddy! <laughs> Uh, that night we went and celebrated, and uh, we went out to Central Market, and we both we both dropped like thirty bucks uh, for uh, a couple of bone like inch and a half bone in ribeye steaks. Oh. We we put a little olive oil in it, salt and pepper. That was it. <laughs> We just flipped like 10 minutes, five minutes on each side. Those things were bloody rare in the middle, and we ate them with our hands, and we watched Tori go. <laughs> it was a blast. So, yeah, we got to, like, we were watching the subtitle version on Hulu, as it was going, you know, the simulcast, and we were doing the voices and practicing together while we were just picking out on these delicious things. And, uh, some asparagus, and we were just having a ball, and that was that. That's one of my favorite memories ever, is just sitting there going, going a quest for fire. <laughs> ah! <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, yeah, and this is more and more, when you work at a place like that, like, you have some days that are just like, oh my god, and then you have other days where everybody's just having a blast and we're getting to, you, 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 you get to get together with not only a bunch of people that enjoy what they do, but they're, uh, you're, they're also artists in the same, in a lot of the same ways that you are, and so you get to work and be creative, and you also get to be a geek, and it's, it's perfect. Um, it's back to, um, double question. Okay. Um, what was your first reaction to the Kentucky Fried Chicken? Uh, or Kentucky Fried Chicken? So, yeah, the Kentucky Fried Chicken was just like, oh, really, guys? Like, like, McDonald's was funny enough. Like, one of those things like, oh, I love you guys. And the fact that, uh, you know, like, when it shows, uh, Lucifer's gaming system, instead of PS Vita, it just says pasta. <laughs> just like, oh, it's like, hmm, I think that come from Italy. <laughs> I think a little Italia action might even happen with that. It's like, I'm surprised someone hasn't taken a screenshot of that and put, like, a video game-ized looking version of it, just Italy on their guy. Hello! <laughs> just something with that little ridiculous happy face of his. Uh, uh, I love that. Uh, but yeah, Kentucky Fried Chicken is like, really? <laughs> it's amazing, and it's funny as heck. But that just made me think, wow, I wonder what Kentucky Fried Chicken is like for them over there. Like, do they follow the original recipe, or is it like tofu chicken? <laughs> <laughs> 
I know, right? Yeah, I just every time I, I, I like I, I've got, I have to go to Kentucky for a con later this year, and I'm just really hoping I don't accidentally say it's so great to be back here in Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> Where's your fried chicken? <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. Sure. Well, guys, that is, we have, I think I have time. Uh, we're right on the cusp. We have my time for one more quick question. I think I can. Anybody have something? No. Like, oh, okay, just throw something out. Why not? Jellyfish. <laughs> <laughs> Can't do that in just one minute. Okay, all right, hang on. I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll try to get it out real quick. Favorite thing about Princess Jellyfish? It brought me back into anime when I was really starting to get burned out. Uh, I feel like it's one of the best. It was one of the first times that we've seen the Japanese really try to take a chance with the storyline after the whole. Because like, we, we went through a, an ish, uh, a period in the 2000s, the early 2000s, until just a couple of years ago, where they really would not make anything that they did not know would sell because piracy and everything else was so rampant for them. They were they were hurt. Like we lost so many studios over in Japan because of like a lot of piracy back in the early 2000s. They just didn't know how to deal with it because they used the internet differently. Um, Jellyfish was not only this wonderful collection of all things nerd, but it was this. It was the first time I'd ever seen a transgendered or crossdresser individual not only portrayed in a positive light in, in, in any sort of show like that, but also portrayed as a role model. And it is also this wonderful human story where he like about these these four four or five women especially Tsukimi, but these four or five women that, while they are beautiful and they love the stuff that they're into, they feel like the stuff that they're into makes them weird and they feel like they are ostracized, that like they need to be ostracized and they can't belong in society or they can't belong to the stylish and the pretty and then the princesses that live out there. And this cross-dresser comes along and teaches them, hey, no, you're strong, you're beautiful, you just have to believe it. And yeah, while the world might be judgy about the way you look, if you want to, if you want people to notice you, if you want to make a difference, yeah, you do have to put on your battle armor, but you're still you beneath it. And like it's, it's just, that's it. Like that, everything about that show, wonderful lessons, very human story. I hope they continue with the manga still goes on, but yeah, it's just that show kind of saved me, and uh, I, I think it's touched a lot of people. So that's definitely what I love about Jellyfish. Thank you for the question, and thank you all so much for coming and chilling with me. Thank you. Thank you. Weekend. Uh, it's today at four. But if you cannot make it to it, or if there's something that you else you just have, like to have signed afterwards, or if there's any questions you wanted answered that you couldn't ask here, I'll be walking around. Please feel free to come up to me. It's why I'm here. So talk to you guys. Come on up. Enjoy the rest of the show. Uh,